Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine's Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, a wide open conversation with Esther Wojcicki. Joining Esther today is Moment's Editor-in-Chief, Nadine Epstein. Today's session is being recorded. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Following today's program, please visit Moment's website where you will find a variety of articles to read during this holiday season. Our next Zoominar, What's So Funny About Jewish Humor with author William Novak will take place in two weeks. Now for today's program. Esther Wojcicki is famous for three things, teaching a high school class that has changed the lives of thousands of kids, inspiring Silicon Valley legends like Steve Jobs, and raising three daughters who have each become famously successful. What do these accomplishments have in common? They are all the results of Trick, Esther's secret to raising successful people, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. Simple lessons, but the results are radical. Esther is a leading American educator and journalist, mother of YouTube CEO, Susan Wojcicki, Fulbright scholar, Janet Wojcicki, and 23andMe founder, Ann Wojcicki, as well as a teacher and mentor to James Franco and Lisa Brennan Jobs. Esther is widely heralded as the most successful parent and educator in the United States. Esther offers essential lessons for raising, educating, and managing people to their highest potential. She is the author of Moonshots in Education and the bestseller, How to Raise Successful People. Most recently, she, co -found, she is the co-founder of Track.app, an innovative way to empower students using a by kids, for kids, revolutionary model. We are proud to have Esther serve on the Moment Magazine Advisory Board. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Moment's Editor-in-Chief, Nadine Epstein and Esther Wojcicki. Hi. So well, honored to be here. Thank you so much for that great introduction. <laughs> so I have a disclaimer to make. Esther and I are friends and uh, reading her book made me realize why. We have so much in common. We were shaped by so many of the same forces. We have such similar outlooks on life. And the foreword by her daughters is similar to what I would have written to my mom. My mom was a teacher and an intuitive leader. And of course, my dad is a physicist, uh, just like <laughs> Esther's, Esther's husband, Stan, is. And uh, moreover, if I was to write a parenting book, really, if I was to write a book of why a guide to wise human behavior. This is the book that her book, her new book is the one that I would have wanted to write. It's really an inspirational book and it's really worth reading at any age and any stage of life, whether your kids are grown up, whether you haven't had kids yet, whether you never had kids, you still learn so much. So um, I, I'm really excited to have Esther here. Thank you so much. I'm really excited that you were well entertained for the last 24 hours reading the book. <laughs> um, so I've talked to you lots of times, but I actually didn't read the book until the last 24 hours. So, yeah. um, so well, we've had a lot in common even before the book. Yes. Um, so Esther, you had a very, you had, a, as you read in the book, you had a very difficult childhood. Um, an authoritarian father, um, a loving mom who uh, was afraid of your dad. Uh, you grew up as a, the, a second class gender, shall we say nicely, in a Jewish family where the boys came first. Uh, you experienced terrible tragedy and you actually barely averted tragedy and death yourself. Um, I thought maybe you could tell us just a tiny bit about that and the lesson that you took from that. That's in the, that's, that sort of for, informs this book. Right. So, um, yes, as you said, I grew up in a, in a very sort of traditional Jewish family. My parents were Russian immigrants, and they thought they had come to the land of milk and honey. The only problem is they arrived, you know, at the end of the 1930s, and somehow all the milk and honey was gone. And it was a very difficult time, as we all know. Um, Anyway, we're lucky that they got out because otherwise I wouldn't be here. And uh, 
so as a traditional Jewish family, you know, the boys are really prioritized quite a bit. And that was made very clear to me, actually verbalized in so many words. And I actually didn't believe it. I thought, I thought that they were making it up. But as time went on, I realized that it was true, that that's the way it was. And, it, and you know, that I just had to cope. And so while they sort of pampered my brother as much as they could, they didn't pamper me at all. They used me as part of the team. You know, I was able to, well, I was given tasks like, um, you know, cooking and cleaning. And I was just remembering one of the things that I did. I just remembered recently that I used to, um, the washing machines back in those days, they were just a tub. And then you had to take the clothes out of the machine and put it through the wringer. And so, you know, there's that phrase, you know, don't get caught in the ringer. Well, I just remember that I was tasked, I always used to have to put the clothes through the ringer. And I was always admonished, like, don't get your hand caught in the ringer because we don't have any money to go to the doctor. And so that was, I mean, that was just part of the way we grew up. It was just, that was, that was life. And then when I was about 10 years old, this tragedy, unfortunately, happened to my youngest brother who was um, playing with a bottle of aspirin on the kitchen floor and then accidentally ate them. And my mother, again, being an immigrant and, you know, not really trusting herself and thinking everything in America was, you know, much better than where she had been, called the doctor, asked him what he thought she should do. And he obviously didn't listen to what she said because he told her something that no sensible person would have ever said, which is put him to bed and let's see how he is in a few hours. Well, you know, again, not feeling confident about herself and not wanting to go against the doctor, she did what he said. And anyway, to make a very long story short, it's all in the book, um, he died. And so this, um, without me saying it to myself, what this did is I said to myself, my God, no whether, matter whether people have long titles after their name, whether they're doctorate, professor, I don't care what they are, you know, you always have to check it yourself. You always have to make sure. And with, again, subconsciously, what it did is make me want to know everything. So I spent the next rest of my teenage years and my, actually I was 10 at the time, so all the way through, just in the library. I mean, I was just reading all the time and my favorite thing to read was nonfiction. And I, I just wanted to know like about the world. And of course I did read fiction as, as well. I just became a really strong reader. Um, and you know, this, this philosophy of not trusting anybody, it saved me, you know, because we, you know, it was one tragedy after another. We unfortunately, after that had um, in our house, all of a sudden my younger brother, I have one brother still now, uh, he sort of fainted on the floor. And then my mother started to faint also, and we didn't know what the problem was. And so finally she went outside and she said to me, lie down on the bed and you know, you'll be better in a few minutes and then you can come out. Well, if I would have followed her instructions, I would have been dead because it was carbon monoxide poisoning. And the only way to escape was to go outside. So of course I did not follow her instructions. I remember crawling down the steps um, to get out. So, I mean, this sort of reaffirmed to me myself that it's most important to trust your instincts and to learn as much as you can to protect yourself. And that really guided me um, in my life, but it also guided me the way that um, I educated as a teacher because I always wanted to give kids the tools so that they could always verify and check whether it was true or not. And, um, and I, I, I used that in English class. I taught English at one point, taught social studies, and then I ended up teaching journalism. That was my main focus. And in journalism, of course, you know, if your sources, I say, if your source doesn't make any sense, don't quote them, you know, you've got to be sensible. And it's amazing how empowering that is for kids. And uh, that just, it made a huge difference in the lives of thousands of kids. 
So that's an abbreviated version of the story that you will find when you read my book. There's a lot more details in there that are actually pretty interesting. Well, we're going to come back to Trick in a minute, but I wanted to just take a pause and talk about Judaism for a moment. You definitely rebelled against your Orthodox upbringing as a child. Um, yet I know that you care a great deal about Judaism and that it's very important to you. And I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, have, do you feel tapped into uh, a creative force that's within Judaism? Do you see Judaism differently than you did as a child? Yeah, I, I see Judaism very differently as, than I did as a child. You know, as a child, you know, growing up in an Orthodox home and, you know, being a girl, you know, I couldn't have a bat mitzvah because girls were not allowed anywhere near the bima. You know, the girls were upstairs, the boys were downstairs. Um, basically, it, it was a very limiting factor for me. And, um, you know, my parents did not want me to go to college and they only wanted to pay for my brother to go to college. And so, and they wanted me to get married at 18. They had prospects for me, people who they'd already picked out that they thought were good matches. And I decided I wanted to go to college to UC Berkeley. I mean, I applied to one school. Thank God I got into that one school and I got a scholarship that paid the tuition, but didn't pay for my room and board. And so, you know, I struggled. They disowned me financially um, because they said, you're gonna go to college, you're gonna have to pay for everything yourself. And so I, I took a bus, a Greyhound bus to go from Los Angeles to Berkeley. And that's how I got to school. And, um, but I was determined to get a college degree and to get out of that, um, confinement that I felt that the Jewish religion was putting on me. I mean, as I got older and realized that there's so much richness there and the values are my values, um, of course, I went back to Judaism. And, you know, all three of my daughters sent their children to, um, to Jewish schools. I don't know, actually, one of them only did the nursery school part. But, um, you know, I feel really strongly and very connected to the values. And I think Judaism today, not the Orthodox Judaism, but, you know, traditional Judaism today, you know, respects women. And I think that's a huge step forward for me, for my, for my perspective. But the Hasidic Jews still don't. Um, I gave a talk at a, it's a, it was a, actually an amazing talk at a Hasidic Jewish Shabbaton that lasted for an entire weekend. And there was all rabbis there, it was 1,100 of them. And I was dressed completely in black. I was covered completely. And it was, it was actually a big honor for me to be able to give a talk to them. And what I talked about was my grandfather from Russia, who was a rabbi, and you know the values that he gave passed down to me, and the values I passed down to my children. So it was a pretty inspirational um, experience for me. And so that's where we are today. But we are not Orthodox because that I think they still are. There's still a lot of um, sort of discrimination against women in the Orthodox religion. I remember my grandfather used to get up in the morning and his first prayer was, he was thanking God he wasn't born a woman. Oh gosh. <laughs> I don't, um, you've never, well, at that point, you know, I understood a lot of Hebrew. So Suzanne mentioned trick in the beginning and introduced trick. And I was wondering, um, well, first of all, how would you describe it? And when did you actually give it a name? Because obviously it's something you were thinking about for a long time. And uh, when did you invent a name for it? So I invented a name for it when I, I gave a talk, a TED talk in Boston. And people kept asking me like, what do you do? What did you do in your class? Why is your program growing so big? You know, why are your kids the way they are? 
And so I sort of put it together for that talk. It's a TED talk. And I, it was the first time that I had talked about it. And if I look back at that talk, I, it's online somewhere. Um, I realized that it was, um, you know, it was the first, first round. And then um, I wrote this first book in 2015 called Moonshots in Education. And the reason I wrote that was because so many teachers were asking me why everybody was taking the program. So I should just tell you my program started in 1984 with 20 kids. And by the time I wrote that book in 2015, I already had about 600 kids in that program. And today there's almost 800. And the question was like, what are you doing? Why are you attracting all those kids? Why do they want to be there? And, you know, this is just a writing program. It's journalism. You know, most high school journalism classes have 20 kids in them. Um, so the answer is in the book. And that's why I came up with the trick model. Because what I did with my students is I trusted and respected them. That was the key. And in trusting and respecting them, I gave them a lot of freedom. And everybody wants freedom. That's why all those people came to America. That's why your parents came to America. We all want to be trusted and respected. We want to be given the freedom to do things on our own. I gave them a lot of independence. I never dictated. I always collaborated with them. And I always treated them with kindness. And if you ask kids in most classes anywhere in the United States or probably in the world, if their teachers are kind, well, almost none of them will say that the teachers are kind. And I just wanted to go against that and say, well, you know, you when you learn, the most important thing you do when you learn is you make yourself vulnerable and you make mistakes. And so it's okay to make a mistake. And I, I made grading, I changed the way I graded. I never graded on the first attempt no matter what it was, you always got to revise, whether you were in my English class or my social studies class. I even did it in math, can you believe? Math. And um, I was never a mathematician, although I took math in college because my first major was zoology of all things. And so when I taught math, you know, I had learned the math just, you know, prior to the time I was teaching it. And so I was really great at explaining it because, <laughs> You know, three weeks earlier, I didn't know how to do it either. <laughs> and so my students ended up being the testing the highest in the school district. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but anyway, so I, I think giving kids an opportunity to revise and to treat them with kindness makes a huge difference. And um, so that's how I came up with the trick model. And then in 2000. Uh, 19, the first, the book came out in 2019, paperback of How to Raise Successful People just came out in 2020, just actually at the end of August. Um, but I did that for that book as well, because I really wanted people to understand what they could do as parents to have an easier time. And they, they as parents would have an easier time and their kids would just love it. Um, they'll be so much happier. And here in the pandemic, I think I should just tell you that my students at Palo Alto High School that are still producing these newspapers and magazines, we have 10 publications now, um, we put the kids in charge of the Zoom calls and the teacher acts as a coach. And I'll tell you, there's nobody that doesn't come to the Zoom call because they all want to interact with each other. They're all peer-to-peer -peer learning. So um, the average Zoom call in America today the teacher lectures for at least 50 minutes. And then after that, you know, they assign some work or something. And after three or four hours of that, of course you're brain dead, you know, you know that because lecturing is not an effective way to learn. Well, let's step back to being a mom. You talk about in the book how, you know, Susan comes home, you're in the hospital and suddenly you're holding Susan and you have no idea what to do. You have no idea how to parent. You have, you don't want to parent the way your parents have parented. And so what, is there, is there a lesson or two from motherhood that helped lead to trick? Yeah, there is a lesson or two from motherhood. Yeah, I did not know anything about taking care of babies when Susan was born. I was teaching in 
let's see, school got out June 15th and Susan was born July 5th. So I didn't have a lot of time to prepare and I had no idea, nothing. I didn't have any friends that had babies. I don't know how to diaper a baby. I don't know anything. So I stayed in the hospital one day longer. They were really nice to let me do that. And they taught me as much as they could in one day. And then I did not want to bring my daughter up the way that I had been brought up because there was so many constraints. And so I, the main thing I wanted to do, my goal for them was for them to be as independent as possible. That was just the one goal. And then I read this book, Dr. Spock. That was the only book out there. And it became my favorite book. And on page one of Dr. Spock, if you haven't read it, he says to you, trust yourself, trust your instincts. And I thought, my God, I really like this guy already. And <laughs> this is my book. And so I, that's what I did. I trusted my instincts. And I wanted to make sure that my kids learned whatever, to be as independent as possible, as early as possible. So I taught them all kinds of things, including, I think the most shocking thing I did, and it's in the book also, is that I taught them to swim very early because we have a swimming pool in the backyard and I didn't want to have any accidents. So they learned to swim, you know, at ages when most people just, their kids are toddling around. They were between the ages of 12 and 15 months. And turns out that toddlers, really small kids like that, can learn to swim. Um, I Again, I bought a book. Books were my friend. And the book was How to Teach Your Baby to Swim. I was like, wow, this book is for me. And <laughs> I still have it, by the way. And I just followed it. It was like a recipe for making cookies or something. And I just followed it. And sure enough, they learned to swim. They could swim from one end of the pool to the other. And it was... I told you some stories in the book about, you know, Janet, who had no hair, but could talk and walk and, and also swim, jumped into our local swim club swimming pool when she was about 14 months old. And this man who thought she was going to drown jumped in after her. And she was really offended, you know, because <laughs> he, he was trying to save her and she was like, go away. <laughs> it was pretty, anyway, yeah, turns out. So I did a lot of, of uh, giving them a lot of responsibility early on. And I think that was the foundation of them feeling good about themselves. And I, I, I mean, that was my only goal. But then as I realized as they were growing up, that they were self-confident. They did really well in all situations because they felt good about themselves. Um, I respected their ideas. Well, not all the time, but sometimes, you know, and um, I, I had this other book that I would use sometimes that focused on the consequences, you know, let natural consequences happen and let them be able to explore the world the way that it is and don't constantly be um, clearing the path for them. Let them understand what they face. So that's what I did with them. And it worked out, you know, I was, by the time they were five years old, oh, well, Susan was six, Janet was five, I mean, they could do a lot of stuff to help me. And I mean, including, um, you know, they would help clear the dishes. They would, they would do a lot of household stuff, which they didn't consider as chores. I didn't pay them to do chores. They got allowance just because um, we all got an allowance, you know, and so they got one too. And they would... Um, they, they would ride their bike everywhere. I don't think little kids do that so much anymore, but they would ride their bikes to, you know, two or three miles away, um, local swim and tennis club. They were, there were, used to be dime stores back in those days, and they would ride their bike to the dime store with their allowance and then spend hours agonizing over what they were going to buy with their, I don't know, 94 cents or whatever they had. Um, so that was, I still think that making your kids, giving them that goal to be independent is, a, is really empowering them. And then I came up with this idea when I was writing the book 
because I saw the opposite happening. The more you do for your child in today's world, people do way too much for their kids, mm -hmm. the less empowered your child is because they think they need you to help do whatever it is they want to do. And so I never, I, I showed my students how to do things, but I didn't do it for them. And it was the same way for my daughters. I didn't do it for them. They had to do it themselves. And I was there as a mentor, but, or the mom, but I, I refused to do it. Did, did you have an aha moment once where like you knew that let's say Susan had actually learned this lesson and she was going to be okay. I know once my son did something, my son went to summer camp and I was a single mom and I, I sent him to this really nice summer camp and all he did was get dirty. And I, and he just would come home covered with mud year after year after year. And finally, when he was about 10 or something, I said, well, you know, there are, you might try some other activities this year. And secretly, unbeknownst to me, he, he did, he took this to heart. And at the end of the summer, he came home like the top kayaker. Now he's never kayaked since then. <laughs> he has no interest in kayaking, but he had this little certificate. He just handed it to me and walked away. And I was like, oh, you know, he can do whatever he wants to do. I had no idea. So I'm just wondering, did you have a moment like that with Susan or, or Janet or Esther that stays in your mind? Well, I, you know, I had early experiences of them being very empowered and doing what they, what they wanted. Um, one that really sticks in my mind is we moved to Geneva, Switzerland when Anne was born. And I sent them to a, an international French school, international, but it was international. So I had a lot of international kids. And Janet, who was three at the time, three and a half, um, she decided that she wanted to be in the five-year-old class and she just moved herself into the five-year-old class. And um, they, it took them about seven weeks to figure out that she was three instead of five because she was pretty articulate. And then when they figured it out, oh my God, you know, the Swiss are very rule oriented and they're like, oh, can't be in this class. I have to go back to the three-year-olds. Well, she was insulted you cannot imagine and so she she wanted to leave and she withdrew and went to another school this is three and a half years old <laughs> wow <laughs> so um yeah i think that's one there's others you know they um they would at the age of i think five and six they would ride their bikes to a local swim club which was about a mile away and since they could swim and play tennis, they could go. I felt pretty comfortable with them going. Um, I, I mean, I gave them, in today's world, there are all these very worried parents. And there are laws in about 20 states that forbid you from letting your child walk down the street by themselves. Uh, California is not one of those states, but there's others and you can be arrested. You can be arrested for leaving your children at home alone. Uh, I think it's below the age of 12, something like that. So I think embedded in the American fears today are all these stories that people read about in the paper. It happens, you know, they're isolated cases, but you extrapolate from that one story and say, oh, could happen to my kid. And so there's a lot of fear there which controls all the parents and controls the laws and makes it very difficult to give your children independence. So I suggest camp. Camp is a good place. Uh, sports, great opportunities, you know, around the house, give them a lot of opportunity. Let them plan your vacation. Honestly, they do a great job. Um, let them plan the dinner for Saturday night and make it for you. Um, it might not taste as great as you think, but anyway, it's an opportunity for them to do it. There's a lot of things they can do. My five-year-old, one of my five-year-old uh, grandchildren is in charge of vacuuming. And I came over there the other night, just two nights ago. 
and they had spilled, I don't know, something all over the floor. And the next thing I know, without being asked, she went and got this vacuum. And it's it's one of those that, you know, doesn't need a cord. I hadn't seen those before, but anyway, no cord needed. She just flipped it on. And the next thing I knew, everything was vacuumed up. And she, I mean, the vacuum was twice as tall as she is. And she just managed to do it really well. So kids are very talented. I think we, we just overprotect them. You talk in the book about how there were, you took, I think it was Susan's kids out to Target and let them buy their own, um, their own school supplies and did they and what happened <laughs> so yeah I I one it was a Saturday morning and I went over to Susan's house and I she's like mom you know the girls need to have school supplies Janet's kids do too they all need something oh and Adam needs a haircut and I looked at Adam and yeah he looked like a shaggy dog and so I said sure I'll take him to Target and so they loaded in the car I went to Target and then I thought to myself, well, who knows how much, what, who knows the best school supplies to buy after all? Not me. I didn't, I mean, I'm not eight years old or nine years old. I'm, you know, grandmother. So I said, hey guys, I'll just drop you off at Target and you can run in and shop yourselves and buy the school supplies and call me when you're done. And then I'll bring over the credit card. In the meantime, I'll take Adam to have his haircut. So I dropped him at like super cuts or what it was a great clip, something like that. And I said, how do you want your haircut? And he, I don't know, indicated some crazy thing. And I was like, well, we'll just go in there and tell him how you want your haircut. Here's $12. So then I was busy driving back to Target to see, you know, what, how they were doing. And I got this phone call. And in the middle of the phone call, Susan's like, so how are the girls doing with the shopping? And I was like, well, I dropped them off at Target, and so they're shopping. I don't know how they are. <laughs> they're fine. I'm, I assume they're fine. And it was just in super long silence. I was like, Susan, are you okay? She's like, what? You dropped them at Target by themselves? I was like, yeah. I mean, they're like nine years old. They're old enough to figure out what they need for school supplies. Anyway, she had a gigantic fit. She's like, Target. I said, last time I looked at Target, Susan, it was pretty safe. I didn't see any bad people walking down the aisle. Anyway, to make a long story short, I went back and sure enough, they had wonderful school supplies. I gave them the credit card. I showed them how to sign it. They put it in and signed it themselves. And then we came out. So this is just an example. I think Susan is just an example of parents today. They're really fearful of letting their kids in and I mean, in a store like that, where things are pretty safe. And then I went to pick up Adam and he looked great. Okay, it was not my style, but he looked terrific. And so I brought him home and everybody was sort of looking at me, Susan was growled, but you know, she was fine. The Though the girls talk about it all the time. They're like, all puffed up like peacocks. We're so smart, you know, we can, <laughs> we can shop by ourselves. <laughs> But I should just tell you, it had an impact because then later on, I found out that they decided I was right and they let other kids go to Target by themselves too. So there, I worked out. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so is there an example from your teaching experience of a, of a, of a, of a moment when you gave a kid, a student some freedom or some kind of response that really led them to a new level of understanding of themselves? Well, I have a lot of examples. Um, if you want in-class examples. Um, so in class, I put my students in charge of something that was really important and part of the, the official duties of the teacher, and that is taking role and um, monitoring the tardies. And, you know, let me tell you what that does for kids. They are so empowered by that little task. And they're so empowered by being in charge of their peers. So that was one thing I did. But the other thing that I did was an annual event. Just so you know, not all kids could take a part in it because I could only take 52. And that was before I knew you, I think. Otherwise, I might have come to DC. 
I took 52 kids to New York City for a week for 16 years in a row. And um, you can imagine what that's like. 52 kids, we occupied the entire center of a plane. You know, I had, the reason I had 52 is buses hold 59. And so we took up an entire bus and getting into the city. But then once they were there, I gave them a lot of responsibility to try to understand how New York City is organized. It's actually very easy to get around. And then I taught them how to use the subway. Um, and then the first few days, the first two days, they had to stay with me. But after that, I gradually gave them more and more responsibility so that by the end, they knew how to use a subway. They all had these 24 hour, seven day passes. Uh, they knew where the museums were. They knew. So th my goal was to empower them and it worked. I mean, I have kids who went on those trips who come back and say that was the most empowering thing they did. Um, and, you know, kids that moved to New York because of the trip. Um, so I think that that, but that's an unusual thing. Most teachers would not do that, um, you know, but that was something that I did. But in the class, I think giving kids an opportunity to be part of a group and edit each other's work. They work together as teams on different pages of the publication. They were in charge of the entire publication, which was the size of the New York Times, three sections. Um, they came up with story ideas. They were, they did all the layout design, editing, everything. The fact that I gave them that responsibility really empowered them. And that then the paper came out, everybody wanted to read it. It was like disappeared in a flash. So I think uh, it was a combination of things, but the philosophy of the class and the kids knew it right away was this is a class to empower me. This is where I'm going to learn how I can, you know, follow my dreams. Well, I just want to add that in the book, you talk about how you only, you never lost a student in New York. However, you, you did lose a chaperone once. That's right. <laughs> I never lost a student. And, and after 16 years, I stopped doing it because the rules and regulations got so strict that I couldn't continue it again. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and basically I had to carry a backpack full of EpiPens and every kid had to have their own EpiPen in my backpack. And that kid, if they had the slightest allergy, had to never leave my sight. Got to be a little overburdening. I, I don't think, we never had the nut allergy problem 20 years ago. Now the nut allergies seem to be everywhere. And so it just got to be too constraining. And so, but I, I never did lose a kid, never. But I did lose that. Can you imagine a chaperone? I lost her in Central Park. <laughs> I, got, I could not believe it, you know, 50 year old woman. But anyway, she finally made it back, but she admitted she got lost in Central Park. <laughs> so I want to switch to the business world. You give an example in the book of how Google, which by the way, got its start in your daughter Susan's garage in Menlo Park, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And um, how Google created this policy of Basically, it's 20% policy, which gave employees 20% of their time off to develop a project that was somehow related to Google. Um, and, um, and, and it actually led to the development of, of products like Gmail, which we all use today. And I guess this was sort of somehow, you talk about its connection to truck, trust and trick. And I'm wondering, you know, how does this, um, how does trick apply how can it apply to the business world? Well, it does apply 100% to the business world. And I, the acronym was not discovered, or I didn't find it until, remember, 2015, when I wrote the first book, How to Re uh, Moonshots in Education. Um, but the initial, I remember listening to those stories that they were talking about when it was first started. They hired the best people they could find, and they trusted them trusted and respected them. Not only did they trust and respect them, they took good care of them. You know, so when Google opened its first doors that were not in Susan's garage, but even in Susan's garage, they did it. Um, they had food 24 hours a day, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 
and then micro kitchens. So you could eat all the time. They brought in doctors that, you know, if you don't feel well, you go to the doctor. You walk around Google and they have these pods. I mean, it looks just like a big ball. It's really kind of funny. And you, oh, you can open it. And what it is, it's a place for you to take a nap if you want to take a nap. And, you know, I tried it out. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, but that philosophy led to the 20% time, giving employees an opportunity to work on projects that they care about. And Gmail was one of those projects. But they have a lot of them. They're listed in... Uh, if you go to Wikipedia on Google 20% time projects, there's a lot of them listed there. And that shows trust and respect for your employees. And it gives them an opportunity to work on something that is important to them. And so I, following that, I came up with a similar policy that I said, I have a nonprofit called Global Moonshots in Education. I said that we should give all kids in school 20% of the time to work on projects that they care about, things that matter to them. And it can be coding, it can be, you know, whatever, whatever the kid likes. It can be ecology, it can be climate change, it, you know, can be knitting. I don't care what they want to do. And um, a lot of schools like it because it's not threatening. And also I have this new company that I just uh, started with my former students, started in June of this year. And it's called, well, actually it didn't start then, it just launched in October, but you know, we got together for the first time in June. Uh, it's called Tract, T-R-A-C-T dot app. And the goal of that, that company is to provide learning opportunities by kids 15 to 20, four kids, eight to 15, because there's nothing, no one that a young kid emulates and respects more than a kid who is just a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to put them together. It's very, it's like my class actually, because my class was all based on peer to peer learning, 10th graders, 11th graders, 12th graders, all in the same class together all working together in teams and helping each other. And so um, this is the same thing online, working together on projects that they care about. And one of the things we say on the website, it's topics that you're never gonna learn in school. <laughs> so, and it's topics that kids want to teach each other. Well, maybe some of the things you might learn in school. Cause I think, for example, one of the kids did a, a learning path on building um, a Greek, Greek buildings or building a Greek city in Minecraft. Okay, you'd never do that in school, but definitely would learn something about Greece, I hope. I don't know anymore whether they're still teaching that they should. Um, so, so are there, oh, are there other businesses that are using the model, your, your trick model? There are other businesses that are using the okay. trick model. So um, one, of, one of them I talked to was um, Whole Foods, the original um, founder, and uh, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's does a great job. I, I met both of these people at something called Conscious Capitalism. Uh, it's a conference that's held in Houston, no, Austin, Texas. And they're using it. There are multiple companies that are empowering employees by giving them trust and respect. And um, there's um, Panera Bread was also doing it. And there was one, uh, I'm just trying to remember the yogurt company is it's, it's Chobani, I think it is. Yes, Chobani. Yeah, yeah. Chobani is doing it. All. There, there's, I, there's a lot of companies that I met there that uh, embrace this idea and then are treating their employees with um, the trick model. So I also started um, a sort of a training program for companies and with a woman who lives in Amsterdam and it's called, the name of it is called the trick And if you go online, you can see the trick method. And we just started 
literally last week. So because there's been a demand, people have been asking for it. And so I thought, well, okay, we'll do that too. And she's great, this woman. Um, she's a, a really um, incredible person. Her name is Jos Dirks, J-O-S Dirks. She speaks English like she was born in England, but she also speaks a lot of other languages. And so this is international to, to help companies embed more trust and respect for their employees and giving a lot of independence. That's where innovation comes from. So the whole trick model is empowering. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one other company that's using this same model. I didn't talk to them, but they must have learned about it somewhere similar. It's called Siemens, the company in Germany. Yes. They just so announced they're doing that too. So before we open up to questions, and I know there's a lot of them, um, so how does trick apply to democracy? So here we are in this era where government is difficult, difficult for people to come together and govern. Um, it's difficult for us to have a civil discourse. It's difficult for us to trust one another in almost anything. The same mistrust you see about, you know, being afraid to let your your kid go to the store, it applies to everything here. Um, what do we, and you talk a little bit about this in the book too, but how, how can we take this concept of, of you know, trust and resilience and um, collaboration, um, how can we take these things to democracy? Is this something you've thought about? Yeah, I thought about this for actually a long time. Um, I think democracy is based on trust. Trust of your institutions, trust that your laws are going to be implemented the way they were intended, trust of other people in the society and respect for their opinions. You know, I don't necessarily agree with some of the people politically but I think it's really important for me to respect their opinions and to see their side of the issue. And I think democracy is based on the entire trick model. And if you take a look at countries where there is no democracy, um, like for example, China, I mean, there is very little trust there. And, but you know, they are doing a great job in many ways. So I don't think that the absence of a democracy in China seems to be having a negative impact on them. Um, I, and many people, I was just in China, just in the last, I left at the end of November, just before this pandemic. Um, people seem pretty happy there. Um, but I think it's all what you're used to. You're, they're used to being overseen and being told what to do and not being have a voice, really. Um, but here in America, I think our democracy is built on the trust and respect and welcoming of diversity. We're all from different parts of the world and we all need to respect each other's diversity and our customs and our ideas. And I, I think without that, we don't have a democracy. Recently, George Schultz, the former Secretary of State, um, wrote an article, an op-ed piece, I think it might've been in the Times, I'm not too sure where it was, about how we have to, the only, the only true agreements that he ever saw made were came out of places and conversations where there was trust. And I thought it was, uh, it was a really thoughtful article. I don't know if you saw oh, it. I think he's right. And I think, I think the biggest problem that we encountered under Trump is a loss of trust. Um, we don't trust our news organizations. Uh, all the research shows that we don't even trust our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And what it's done is unleashed or it's made um, socially acceptable to dislike people with 
different viewpoints and different backgrounds and different skin colors. And that is, I think, the most damaging thing for our democracy because uh, the United States is a huge experiment in can all the peoples of the world live together in peace and harmony. And I would say that up until this point, I would say yes. But I think we're at a time where it seems to be under stress at the moment. We cannot continue to distrust our government as a problem. Um, I have a few more questions, but Suzanne, I just wanted, I know we're close to the magic time and I just wanted to see if there's some questions that you have some, for some listeners. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a few questions. Um, one is we, we all know how successful all three of your daughters are. Um, and so the question is, how do you encourage success within a family without creating unhealthy competition? That's a great question. And I think one of the things you do is model it. You know, you model accepting different interests and different um, performances. So some kids learn fast, um, one thing, and other kids don't. So you just want to make it clear that it's okay, whatever way you are. So I know there's a lot of ADD and ADHD out there. And in my classes, I actually never accommodated for that because what my theory, so okay, I'm not a doctor, but this is what I'm just telling you as a teacher, how this worked. Kids that had ADD or ADHD, my theory was they always had just too much energy. And if they would, I was in a portable for 30 years. So I had them running outside around the portables and then come back into class and they were fine. And then when I got this new building that they built for me, 25,000 square foot, in every classroom I had exercycles and kids that had too much energy just hopped on the exercycle. That seemed to work really well for the kids. Um, so I, I just think we need to respect each child and their gifts mm -hmm. and make them feel as though whatever it is that they are interested in is fine. And that's what I did with all three of my daughters, whatever they were interested in. I didn't fight them. Anne, for example, who was musically extremely talented, never used her musical talent, but decided she wanted to be an ice skater instead. Let me just tell you how difficult that is on a mother. They practice ice skating at five o'clock in the morning, okay? I, I let her do it. You know, she ended up being a competitive skater, but, you know, probably resulted in all the wrinkles I've had. <laughs> <laughs> um, did your husband ever disagree with your parenting techniques? And what should parents do if they do disagree? So my husband did disagree um, with my parenting techniques, but you know, he's a Stanford professor and I don't know if anyone knows about professors, but they work all the time and they're busy writing papers and going to conferences and giving talks. And so he didn't have quite the opportunity to impact them the way he might have otherwise. And so he just wanted, he wanted them to toe the line he wanted, the, he wanted them to be, it was really strict. And I was not so strict. I gave them a lot of freedom and a lot of opportunity to do whatever they wanted. And, um, and so that was what, yeah, I, what I do with, if I had a parent that was staying home all the time and then there's two of us and we disagree all the time, I would have the parents talk to each other and see whether they can't to come to some kind of a, an agreement. I think it's bad for the child if one parent says one thing all the time and the other parent says another thing all the time. It just is, doesn't work. I think it's better if you could collaborate somehow. And, and similar to that, um, 
you, you gave an example of you taking your grandchildren out. Um, how do your children um, parent? I mean, do you feel like it's similar to what you do? And, and how do parents navigate being a grandparent with adult children trying to raise their own children? Oh, so like that's the king of all the questions. You got it. <laughs> Okay, so um, my grandchildren, my children are parenting the same way. I never told them what to do, because let me tell you, you can never tell your children how to parent. So all you grandparents out there, you can stop now, because either they won't listen, or they'll get mad, or something that is negative. So, I mean, I would, I used to go from, you know, I would make a suggestion, I would say, you know, it's a little cold outside. Do you think that we should put a jacket on? And even a even a statement like that, you know, sends the hair on somebody's head back up. So I stopped doing all that stuff. And the other thing I had to stop doing is bringing presents all the time. Because, you know, grandmothers, you just like, I, like, I see all these cute things like, oh, I want to buy that. Well, it turns out that you know, they have probably more stuffed animals than anybody ever saw in one location. And so you have to stop doing that because that also, you know, you're in a subtle way impacting that, the, the way that they bring up their kids. So now I just go over and that seems to work pretty well. And then they always assign me a duty. Like I just played chess with my five-year-old granddaughter, I swear, I was like, what have you been teaching her to do? You know, because she beat me. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was really angry. No, I was like, well, and then they told me, oh, she takes chess with a chess master. Well, why didn't you tell me before I ended up playing chess with her? I could not, I, I was actually really shocked. Um, but so that's the main thing that I do. And yes, I, people parent the way they were parented. And that's why if you remember the trick model, it's important for you to remember, you know, if you got hit all the time when you were little, you don't want to do that to your kids. Mm -hmm. And you want to you want to treat them with trust and respect. And if they do things that are really bad, which is, you know, a commonplace thing, if they do things that are bad, the main thing I did was talk to them. And, um, and then you know, I put them in their room so they could think about it for a period of time, but no hitting. That doesn't mm -hmm. work. Uh, thank you. So I have one last question for you, and then I'll hand it back to Nadine to finish up with a, another question or two. Um, you, uh, Nadine asked the question about democracy, and um, you talked about trust um, not being a part of our institutions at the moment. How do we help our children especially our teens and students uh, who are watching this and um, uh, may not feel so help hopeful about the future. How do we turn it around for them um, and that they can start feeling hopeful and trusting again? God, these questions are great questions. I wish I had the answer to all of that, you know, the crystal ball. Um, I think one thing that we need to do is we have to start with some somebody in position of responsibility has got to start the ball rolling in the right way because when you trust people when they deliver what they promised and so people in positions of power have to deliver what they promise and i i don't want to get political here but i would say that over the past four years there has not been a delivery of what was promised. And I don't know whether it's going to be possible to do it with the new administration or not, but I would say it could possibly start with, you know, some of the cabinet officers and some of the local people. We all have to work together to produce a, a, an environment where you can trust and when the delivery that you promise actually takes place. And um, I think that it's just like in a classroom, kids cannot institute by themselves trust. It comes from the top, the teacher has to do it. And so it has to come from the top. The, 
people in responsible roles have to do it. And I certainly hope they do it because we're struggling at the moment. Thank you, Esther. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. And um, we'll have to talk some more another time. It's 5.30. It's actually after, after 5.30. Oh. It's been, well, it's been really a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. For all, us. Thank all your listeners and viewers. I'm really happy that you are here. And I, I appreciate the fact that you came on this Tuesday afternoon. Yes. Uh, thank you again, Esther. Thank you, Nadine. We really appreciate spending this time and learning from you. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will send a follow-up email later this week uh, with all of the information with the names of Esther's books and links, um, and so you'll be able to uh, purchase her books and uh, read more about her trick method. Also, I encourage everybody to sign up for our next Zoominar, which will be in two weeks, and I kindly ask you to consider making a year-end donation to moment so we can continue doing these programs in the coming year. Uh, have a wonderful, uh, healthy, happy new year, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.